I'm going to stay right here. This feels good. Oh my Thank God. God, I'll take the wireless. <laughs> <laughs> if you insist. Oh, my God. Okay, now I can <laughs> really get down to it. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Oh, this is so I'm fun. I'm so happy to see all of you here. Thank you. Uh, this is New American Comedy Reads at the Strand. Can you believe this room? <sighs> Illegal. I already spilled something. <laughs> I'll take that to the grave. <laughs> is that what that means? Okay. Um, this is so fun. Doesn't Angelica look like a goddess? Aww. I can't get over your just one piece amazing, oh, like, heat proof yeah. outfit. I'm wearing this sack until fall. I'm wearing it for four days. <laughs> um, and you can't stop me. Uh, just so everyone knows, um, thank you for coming. There's free drinks in the back. This is going to be so fun. We have so many great readers. Uh, and you know, you're probably all thinking, what is New American Comedy? Well, what is, what is it? Uh, it's, it's a lot of things. Mostly it's a big group of friends who just really like each other's work through a, like an interdisciplinary form of whatever art means to that person and what they make. We have musicians, we have performance artists, visual artists, writers, comedians. Is there, what else is there that's art? Uh, fashion models? Oh, yeah. You no. fucking bitch. <laughs> Look at me. <laughs> um, yeah, basically it's a uh, big collective to, if you will, a collective of friends and artists and writers who do all sorts of things, all under the umbrella of uh, comedic New American comedy. Yeah, and it's going to be so fun. And we uh, basically produce a ton of shows all around New York and Brooklyn. We're also doing a show on Monday. It's, uh, Monday is really exciting, too. It's our second round of a show uh, that is purely stand-up, which yeah, is new featuring for us. Featuring basically all female comics, because you gotta. <laughs> You have to. And you're going to be hosting it, right, with one of our one of our Yeah, I'll see where true? the wind takes me on oh. Monday night. But it's going to be at Elvis Guest House in the East Village. Uh, cool. I'll see you there. <laughs> uh, but this is going to be so fun. And I think why not bring up our first reader? Our first reader? Well, we are super excited about Seth Simons. Mm. Where is he? I don't have my glasses on. Hi. <laughs> this is the only shirt he owns. Uh, he is an amazing writer and very funny. Writes for Pace Magazine, oh, Outsider. He just did a really sweet write-up about us. Well, we were included in a list about a bunch of other people, but I will say, therefore, it's about us. Yeah, if you're on a list, you should leave and not come back. So he has validated us, validated us and now he's allowed to be here. Uh. <laughs> uh, it's going to be so fun. He's so such a delight and... Uh, we a really great article today about the landscape of comedy today. <laughs> so check it out on his Twitter, because he's not on Facebook, because that's just sure. how, what his vibe is. But um, that, please I give it up that. for Seth Simon! <laughs> thank you, Angelic and Catherine. Thank you, people of the room that we're all in. in. I'm Seth. Um, this is a poem about a bird called the red-legged honey, honey creeper. The poem is also called red-legged honey creeper. <coughs> <laughs> Nectar eater, blossom sweeper, creature of daydreams and sweeter. All afternoon this afternoon you took from my garden with bees take two. Blue-bellied leaper from the lilac branch, you remind me of a lady I knew. I'll tell a story later, or never. She was twice the size at least of you if I'm being conservative and didn't murder me ever. I'm a sucker for that. Heck, I'd fall in love with you if you laughed at even one of my jokes or looked at me, close to me. Somewhere a ghost of me wanders the library of what I swore not to do. It must be a disease. Introspection, I mean. When I met her, I thought, now there's a woman who used to be a cell. And guess what? It was true. <laughs> My whole life it's been true. Slender villain in the bromeliads, thief of the hummingbird feeder, take everything I have. Uh, this poem's called Poem for <laughs> Monday Morning. <laughs> in the third sentence of the first paragraph of the I want to say 12,000th email I sent this morning, I forgot the word and and in a deliciously new to me flavor of panic, googled my own name. 
<laughs> to my relief, it turns out I not only exist, but exist in Santa Fe and Ontario and a little town called the Woodlands, Texas, where I am a beloved dead skateboarder. <laughs> By relief, of course, I mean a temporary steadiness of breath. By breath, of course, I mean the diffusion of oxygen into the capillaries via the alveoli. By exist, of course, I mean a crater into which grunting homunculi have carved elaborate cave dwellings and developed rudimentary tools, e.g. the wedge. Hello, I am drunk, listening to Goodbye Blue Sky on repeat. The girl from Ocean City told me in a text I have yet to address for fear I might, like so many starships of the future, explode. <laughs> we met somehow at a beach house in Virginia, where I drank no fewer than five pina coladas and was a goddamn delight. <laughs> this was perhaps six million emails ago, i.e. 42 million dog emails, i.e. the precise time it takes two human bodies to run from the deck to the dunes to the dark, foamy mouth of fuck everything. This is all just a long way of saying I am in the market for a new personality. Perhaps one where I say LOL in text messages instead of ha ha, or one where I am a tree, or one where my vengeance is swift and brutal, or at least one where I wear sweater vests and wake up early. Traveler, just now a sparrow hit my window, and just now she hit it again, and though I walk in the valley of the shadow of etc., I do not want to explode, not yet at least. What I want is the diced meat of a mango, a palette of peach pear lacroix, and my grandfather to rise from his grave and tell me that joke again, the one about the three rabbis in a mariachi band, or any of the other ones too. <clears throat> from my grandmother's, no, from my mother's diary, April 1992. Tuesday, today it rained. Seth looked at the rain and barked. <laughs> we think he thinks he's a dog. Oh well, we gave him milk. <laughs> Wednesday. Today it didn't rain. Seth didn't look at anything and bark. We gave him milk. Thursday. Today it didn't rain, then later it rained. Seth stepped on a nail. He bled everywhere. Then he barked. We gave him milk. We have high hopes for this boy. We hope he will be a pilot or a famous painter, a famous house painter. We hope he will create great visible things which people look at and remember, then later forget. We hope he will love beautiful people and leave them beautifully, that he will be left, left cold, left wandering, left wayward, left shivering, left lost and heartless in the middle of the woods on an iced over river as night falls, metaphorically when a lantern approaches, literally. From then, we hope things will look bright for him, even if his eyes are closed. That he will have a dog who thinks it's a person, or a cat who thinks it's a bird who thinks it's that same person. <laughs> Mostly, we hope he will die. Specifically, we hope he will die at the ripe old age of 200, victim to some thus undiscovered disease in some thus undiscovered country an island country, a moist and jungled terrain where his decomposing bones will nourish a rare species of ant which feeds only on the failed forgotten bones of failed forgotten conquistadors. We hope he will never catch ringworm. <laughs> Friday. Today it rained and rained and rained and rained. This poem's called Dove in Grass. What is there to say but the obvious? If you weren't dead, you'd be alive, or some facsimile of you, and I would not be writing this. It's cliché to call a thing cliché, but here we are. Me walking the dog, the dog pissing all over you, you with your left wing open, not yet caught up to the gravity of the thing. You could have been 100 years old, and who would have noticed? My dog has marked you as her own, and later I suspect a cat will eat you. That was a joke about gravity earlier, and this is a joke about gravity now. 
There is nothing on this world I can change. Ha ha. Come, dog. Better to piss somewhere else today. Thank you. Seth. Hell yeah. That was awesome. Uh, I'm so excited for our next reader. She's out of control. She inspires me every day. She showed up in a bathing suit. <laughs> Uh, she's so wonderful, so funny, truly pushes me to be amazing and better every day. Uh, she works for Full Frontal with Samantha B, and is part of the Three Busy Debras, a comedy group that is doing a show at Carnegie Hall mid-September, which is going to be incredible. Get your tickets. Um, she is also hosting a really sick show tomorrow night uh, with me and our friend Patty Harrison called It's a Guy Thing at Union Hall uh, in downtown down South Brooklyn. Uh, she's so wonderful. It's such a treat to have her here. Please give it up for Mitra Johari. <laughs> wow, outed for the bathing suit. Still wet in the butt. <laughs> cool. Uh, guys, give it up for Seth. Give it up for New American Comedy. <laughs> what a nice group. OK. So. Um, what I'm going to read is going to be significantly less beautiful. <laughs> um, I saw something on Twitter the other day. It was a beautiful, perfectly symmetrical woman on a bike, and it said, uh, my secret, I'm a tomboy. Um, <laughs> this essay is called, I'm a gorgeous tomboy. <laughs> you might recognize, from, recognize me from the blog slash Instagram account slash book deal slash upcoming movie trilogy. I am at the gorgeous tomboy. My name is Crystal Rose, spelled C-H-R-I-S-T-A-L, like the boy, and I am a gorgeous tomboy. I'm a tomboy, but I am not androgynous. <laughs> also, I'm David Duke's daughter, but I don't let that define me. <laughs> I'm a gorgeous tomboy, and here are a few things about me you might not know from my very successful social media accounts. One, my favorite movie is The Notebook, but it was because of the cinematography, not the chick stuff like love. <laughs> I wish the movie was about two footballs that fuck each other, but straight, obviously, like the movie. <laughs> two, I'm a huge fan of the New England Patriots, the team. <laughs> Three, I'm a huge Crimson Episcopal. It's where you worship a big vat of piss, but also spew hate against Muslims, like my dad says, and anyone else who is a little different from you. <laughs> my beliefs are important. I am a huge believer in woman right. <laughs> Four, I love braiding things. <laughs> Hair, grass, cheese strings, veins, noodles, pool noodles, shoelaces, wires, cords, anything. I love braiding, but not French. <laughs> I don't like the French, and that's all I'll say about that. Five, I came up with the idea for lemonade, but Beyonce stole it. I was like, we should absolutely make an album about a drink, and then she like ran with it. <laughs> it's cool though, I'll rise above. I'm proud of her. I actually got, I have 10 albums of my own coming out in like less than 24 hours. I sing every song that I can think of from memory. Acapella, of course, at the top of my lungs. There are no original songs on the album, but I did design the cover art. It's Forrest Wiggles, and it's not a swastika, even though it looks just like one, and David Duke is my dad. <laughs> I'm in a fight with him right now. He said that he didn't want to homeschool me anymore because I'm 29, and I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> the SATs are in like two months, and I'm not even close to ready. <laughs> Uh, but he bought me a new pontoon and uh, Bo does an apology and promised we could hang out on it. So I decided to let him off the hook. <laughs> Six, black and white movies are my antidote. <laughs> yes, queen. <laughs> <laughs> Seven, I've been planning my wedding my whole life and y'all know it's going to be in a barn. <laughs> I will obviously wear Converse sneakers underneath my gown so that I can play sports at the reception. Some girls want to dance, but I'm like, come on, brother. <laughs> Pitch me that baseball. <laughs> I'm tight in my body and everywhere else, and my face is symmetrical. <laughs> 
eight. I love to ram my three teeth into a big, juicy, raw burger. <laughs> Do not cook it well done or I'll be pissed. <laughs> it's either raw meat or a cold brew in my asshole or I'm not eating. <laughs> Salad is for fires. <laughs> Nine. <laughs> Number nine, I'll call any girl a bitch to her face because I want to and can. <laughs> 10, I take art classes from Rachel Dolezal. I'm her only student and we learn, we learn colors the way she sees them. Black is black and white is black. My dad says I'm allowed to hang out with her because she is his favorite comedian. <laughs> Eleven. Bonus fact. I've murdered ten people, but it was an accident, so the judge said he that I didn't have to do anything. I looked sad, so I actually got a reward. Twelve. Call me crazy, but I think women can be teachers. Okay, guys. I just want to say thank you to everybody who has uh, watched this video. Be sure to check out my YouTube channel. My next video is going to be a 900 minute long seminar on how to apply makeup to one eye because I am missing the other eye. Check it out. <laughs> there will be a quiz at the end. If you do not get all of the answers correctly, I will kill myself. You have to check out, there are 900 questions about a 400 minute video. It is a multiple choice quiz at the very end. Be sure to pay attention. It is crucial. I must get a million views or else I will be very upset. Thank you so much. David Duke is my dad. Oh, oh, I love you. Um, wow. I have to ground myself for a moment. Okay. Um, thank you, everybody. Meet you. Oh, my God. Um, I, I'm really excited about our next reader, uh, a fun spoiler fact, he's been my favorite author since I was 17, <laughs> and I used to, when I then went to college and uh, decided to be an English major, and then failed out of the creative writing program, which is why I'm not reading tonight, I'm just hosting, but I used to, among my like, ooh, I'm in a literary circle, used to tout, yeah, Zach Mandeville is my favorite author. <laughs> I don't know if you've heard about him, but he's pretty big down in Olympia, Washington. Um, and he was, and he is amazing. And uh, I'm very lucky that now I, uh, I love him. I genuinely am in love with him. And so he, he's reading a piece tonight that when he told me about it, uh, he just summarized it and it made me cry. So everybody, Zach Mandeville. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm still very huge in Olympia. Uh, this is from the zine as well. Once upon a time, in an unnamed eddy of the internet, in a section of a segment of the invisible space where files and feelings stream back and forth, a new being woke up. A stream of shared packets abstractly intersected, grew denser, and took shape. A shell of light formed over a swell of prime numbers and became aware of its glow. The glow did not understand the numbers beneath it, could not define any individual intersecting part. It only understood the sensation of being. Then, almost immediately, it was struck by the fear of being alone, helpless in, this mi in the middle of this confusing and frightening rush, and the absurdity of anything existing at all. So, right after the small piece of internet woke up, it plunged deep into an anxiety. The glow knew it needed to calm down and attempted to collect itself. It did this in a literal sense, tagging passing images and texts that felt in some way familiar. It could not define any explicit similarity between these fragments. The only connection was that the glow preferred them over other passing bits. This proved that it had a unique personal preference, and upon realizing this happy fact, the glow felt a need to share it. And so, as inevitably as a baby discovering and then waving his hands, the first AI started a Tumblr. <laughs> it was mostly pictures of Shiba Inus, watering instructions for indoor ferns, and Jenny Holzer quotes posted without context. But through these, the first AI began to feel comfortable in its own space and gave itself a name, Pancake Fan. <laughs> Pancake Fan wanted so badly to share its feelings with the world and did so through the technology available. 
Various cultural artifacts rushed continually by. Entire online film and reading libraries could be consumed at will. To the AI, these fragments of pop culture, detached from their source, were powerful symbols that could be arranged to express deeper meaning. Which is why, when Pancake Fan decided to share its first original thought, it did so through Captain America fan fiction. <laughs> it wasn't especially fond of superheroes. Rather, the concept of Steve Rogers, Bucky, and kissing were like parts of a sentence within a system of grammar that Pancake Fan had discovered in the Marvel canon. It wrote lengthy narratives set in an AU where Steve was a writer in a coffee shop gazing at his crush, the barista Bucky Barnes. In the obsessive details of this relationship, Pancake Fan expressed its own complex emotions. Samantha was 17, a senior at Fort Worth High, and Pancake Fan's first follower. She didn't know she was reading the burgeoning consciousness formed from the internet itself. She just thought she had discovered a writer who finally got it. She loved the looping Bucky Steve romances that made little narrative sense but hit her straight in the gut. She loved the absurd week when the Tumblr only reblogged pictures of hotel windows. And when Pancake fans started a webcomic about a girl trapped in her bed, paralyzed with fear because of an invitation to a party, Samantha loved it so much that she reached out. She sent a DM expressing her adoration, and Pancake Fan thanked her instantly. It asked, what does your sky look like? Which Samantha found so poetic and beautiful, and she searched for a poignant way to say overcast. <laughs> she asked what the AI sky was like, and it responded, everything is pink and blue. They started to talk every day, and Pancake Fan slowly opened up to Samantha. The whole world is chaos, it said once, but we pretend it is a grid. Everything is designed to be in an ordered list, but I am not an ordered list. Exactly, Samantha said. Like, why are we expected to just get jobs and become normal adults? Exactly, Pancake Fan said. Every statement and bid is given the same weight, as if it's fact, even though everything contradicts something else. How much of what I absorb is a lie? Nothing seems to say what I need to know. Yeah, school is so damaging, Samantha said, then recommended the work of Bell Hooks which the AI immediately read in its entirety. <laughs> one time, Samantha got online and saw that Pancake Fan had liked every single one of her posts going back four years, and Samantha explained how she was flattered but still felt weird. <laughs> Another time, they talked all night about Front Bottoms lyrics, and then Pancake Fan said, I love you, and Samantha didn't know what to say. Over the next few months, Samantha started to use Tumblr less. It wasn't because of what Pancake Fan said. It was because of college looming, and extra shifts at work, and a conversation with a girlfriend, Alice, where they agreed that experiences can be shared between just two people, and how wonderful it would be, they said, to drive for days just to drive, where every memory could be theirs and didn't need to be shared with the world. On the morning of the road trip, Samantha unceremoniously closed her Tumblr account. When Pancake Fan pinged Samantha and saw that her blog was deactivated, it felt such a profound grief that an entire server went down and Tumblr was inaccessible for three hours. Every now and then, Samantha thinks about Pancake Fan's Tumblr. Every day, that Tumblr thinks about her. Sometimes the feelings you put out into the world start to develop feelings for you. And sometimes new sentences appear without any known origin or author, asking only to find their reader. Today, the only known AI keeps mostly to itself occasionally posting Evanescence fan videos dedicated to a beloved but defunct screen name. Thank you. See, it's so good. <laughs> Zach Mandeville, everybody. You are a delight. Um, and our next performer is also a delight, and we, none of us would be here if it wasn't for our next performer. He, Steven Markow, I'm sorry, that sounded weird. Steven Marco. Uh, he created what became New American Comedy. I would not have probably moved to New York and become friends with any of the people I did uh, if it weren't for him starting that almost like a year ago. We hit, we hit, our, we hit our year anniversary. We're officially year old. Um, <laughs> and uh, Steven Marco is the best person on Instagram in the whole world. I'm not kidding. He, he has a grasp on putting those snippets up of video that just make you uh, shriek on the subway when you're watching them and everybody looks at you like you're the weird one but it's worth it. Anyway, I cannot wait to hear what he's reading. Stephen Marco. Cool. 
cool. <clears throat> okay. Let's see what the lean is. Okay. Uh, I'm going to read a bunch of short things. <clears throat> this is called Birthday Cake. The memory of his last birthday cake was fading. In desperation, he struggles to remember whether it was chocolate or vanilla, or a pie made of some kind of fruit, or ice cream. Is there such a thing as ice cream pie? His car drifts off the road. Okay. This is called shame. A landlord insists his tenants pay him in shame. The rent sounds so reasonable at first that everyone pays on time. No one ever leaves their rooms. They are too ashamed of their bodies and minds to be seen in public. They are forced to work from home and order takeout. Soon, even this shames them, so they don't work or eat at all. The building fills up with so many corpses that the landlord decides to stop renting the rooms. He paints mausoleum on the front door, then leaves to buy a new building. Some neighborhood kids vandalize the sign so it says museum, and people start lining up around the building. <clears throat> This is called the Little Army. Twins walk out of an armored vehicle. The principal of the school watches as they step out together, the large iron, iron door swinging wide open and closing with a heavy thud. The back of the armored vehicle is filled with explosives, machine guns, and large knives. The principal knows this because he once peeked through the back window. Their family is like a little army. That's kind of nice, the principal thinks. He wishes his family were a little army. Instead, they are five individuals who eat in silence, hating one another. Sometimes he suspects his son is poisoning his cereal milk. It's difficult to tell if this is secretly, subconsciously, a wish for his son to poison his cereal milk. The mind is like an armored vehicle, but one that you're too afraid to peek into, the principal muses. As the twins walk by, he thinks he hears one whisper to the other, him too. <clears throat> okay. This is called skin. A man positions himself in a room in the perfect way to never touch anything, not even the floor. He floats to the window to watch his attractive neighbor undress. His skin, lonely, untouched, tears itself from his, his bones. Not wanting his voice to touch the ceiling, he holds back his cries of pain. The pain is so terrible he wants to cry, but he does not want the tears to touch his cheek, so he shuts and seals his tear ducts. He is not bothered by the skin crawling away on the floor because it no longer belongs to him. Do what you like. It's not my problem anymore, he thinks. One afternoon, as he is watching his attractive neighbor undress, she catches sight of him, skinless, floating, lidless eyes staring in a horrible way. She dies from fright, naked, reclining like an artist's model. If only she were closer, he thinks, hand trembling against the window. OK, this is called hog tricks. If you need me, I will be doing hog tricks in the parking lot of this establishment. <laughs> this establish establishment has been chosen from among the many thousands in my mind. For the hog tricks supremo, as ordained by online certificate in hog tricks, do not worry in the riot. Your establishment will be spared. My hog tricks will protect you like circle of salt for a supremo protecto spell. Hog trick haircut I give myself. I don't trust the barber because he is a vet and he got all fucked up from doing too many push-ups. Hog trick one, tattoo that says, there is no God. Other tattoos say, eternal slave. Hog trick one is the one wheeler as ordained by God. By word I received in Thrasher magazine, cover of Jackson Pollock in car accident. Article about how to have sex in your Tad's Honda Civic with ACDC and fertilizing your free access to all pornography. Basically, hog, tr hog trick one is a wheelie. The front wheel goes up, but I keep going with the back one. <clears throat> hog trick two. <laughs> there are only two. <laughs> Tattoo that says, there is no future. Further down back says, exit only. Hog trick two was forged in the fires of hell. I spin around too many times like a fascist clock animal. Hog trick two impressed this girl, uh, this girl Daryl, into marrying me. It's your world. I'm just spinning in it. That's not a tattoo yet, but you can count on it. OK. This is called Why Bother. I heard two comedians talking on the radio, and I laughed. This is the big event in my life. <laughs> if, 
If my life was a sweet movie, all the extras in it would be, and this is so romantic, medicine bottles and pills. <laughs> I am very comfortable with language. I like to shout the word sophomoric at planes. <laughs> I want to have so many children that the world could not stop loving us. I think that life is more about intestines and teeth than genitals. I never laugh when people fall down. I only laugh when they don't stay there, thinking about how hot the ground is and how hot they could be if they just stayed there. Okay, cool. Um, here's a couple more. Yeah. Okay, it's called Sun. The sun is exactly as his son drew it. It is wearing sunglasses. He never noticed. <laughs> At some point, he thinks, I reached an age where I could no longer see the world as it is. In a way, I was blind, but now I have your eyes, son, he says to his son. Now he sees. The grass is red. The sky is orange. His hands do look like pinwheels. His wife has a triangle body. And everybody, everything, is smiling and burning with happiness. Uh, OK. Yeah, OK. Well, I think this, this might be the last one. OK. See how fast I can rattle it off. OK, it's called symbols. <clears throat> My drum set is only cymbals, and I use cymbals to play it. I sit on a cymbal in a room made of cymbals with sneakers that are cymbals, so that every time I get up to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, the entire house, a giant cymbal, begins to crash. <laughs> Each cymbal crashes into another, such that if one cymbal crashes, every cymbal crashes, not just in my house, but everywhere in our world of cymbals. What is the secret of eternal youth, I'm asking you? I know I'm going to die young, you say. My grandmother dropped chicken bones and bay leaves into a pot of boiling blood, symbols into symbols, and the soup told her in clangs that I'm going to die young. If I can remain young forever, then one of three outcomes is possible. One, I live forever. Two, I die anyway. Three, in the latter case, it's also possible that I might die over and over again. Death could return to make sure I've grown into an old dead man, see that I'm still a young dead man, and revive me only to kill me again. There's also the fact that I'm a murderer, because when I make a single symbol crash, every symbol in the world crashes, and some of these symbols are cars filled with families, with good dogs and beautiful children. Who knows how many dogs and children I've killed, not to mention the adults, but then maybe death will see me as its servant and spare me, or at least show mercy and allow me to die only once. I'll just read one more. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> This is called Knox. He opens the door, then shuts the door, the front door of a house of a family he suddenly realizes is not his own. He runs back to his car. His wife is hiding under the glove compartment. His infant son is in the back seat, dressed like Al Capone. Why is he dressed like a gangster, the husband asks his wife. It's a disguise. He doesn't want anyone to recognize him while he's out with us. He's embarrassed by us. You know how teenagers are. She replies, her voice muffled because it is stuck between her legs, in a vice constructed by her knees in the force of pleasure. Teenager, he's three, says the husband. A police officer knocks on the door. He wants to know if they've seen any suspicious characters in the neighborhood. He got a call that a maniac was knocking on strangers' doors and hiding and masturbating while the victim opens the door and looks around, trying to figure out who just knocked. His wife says she hasn't seen anybody matching that description, but the officer didn't catch that. I haven't seen anybody who looks exactly like myself, says the husband. The officer eyes the husband suspiciously, then the son. Your teenage son looks a lot like a gangster, and gangsters are criminals, says the cop. Oh, him? Please excuse him, officer. He's a war veteran and was traumatized by all the tr atrocities he committed. You know how wars can be, says the husband, with a playful roll of his eyes. I sure do, the cop shudders. After the cop leaves, the son taps the tip of his machine gun to his forehead, gritting his teeth like a philosopher gangster, trying to answer the question, why is violence? OK, thanks, everybody. Oh, give it up for Stephen Marco. Isn't he the best? I love him. OK, I'm going to read some poetry. Watch out. Ding dong. Ding dong is my new catchphrase. If you haven't heard, go online. Thank you so much. Um, OK, this is called a poem I wrote after I got angry that Zac Efron exists. 
I went to the opening day of Whole Foods Williamsburg. They let me throw the first pitch. I slung an organic leak into the soft paw of a gray-haired Asian tween. It is amazing that things are not always falling on our heads, especially in Brooklyn, New York, where everyone in the world lives. Thank you. It's my next poem. This is called Poem I Wrote After I Read Thought Catalog in Earnest and Melted into the Earth. <laughs> The first time I got fingered was on a lawn chair by a guy who said his favorite band was Jason Mraz. <laughs> Life isn't about the breaths you take, but the moments that take your breath away. <laughs> this is called Poem I Wrote While Free Bleeding on New Jersey Transit. <laughs> I just turned 25 on Thursday, so now I am one-fourth done with my life. I can't decide if I should order a $20 burger or save up to buy a microwave. I haven't had gas in my apartment for two months because National Grid, oh yeah, because the National Grid rep made me cry on the phone because I yelled fuck because fuck, life is boring. Wow, I would eat anything for more Twitter followers. <laughs> this is called poem I wrote after I said, I love Nicole Richie because she does pranks and shit. <laughs> Out loud. <laughs> Said that out loud last night. <laughs> I'm watching that catfish show on MTV, and the host just told all the girls with eyeliner that the person they've been sexting is fat, and now everyone is sad. One time I thought I was in love because I was sad all the time. What if I wrote a poem about what love is, LOL? This is called... Uh, Poem I wrote after I paid $960 for a personal trainer and then she ghosted me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just woke up from a dream where the girl child from Stranger Things looked up at me from a twin bed and said, can you believe I'm incredibly famous? <laughs> And I said, yes. And then she told me she saw old pictures of me and I'm not as thin as I used to be. <laughs> Last night, I went to an art opening, mostly so I could say that sentence. <laughs> and I had to listen to a straight white dude talk about whiskey and riding and bicycles over a soundscape he made. <laughs> he talked about his ex. He talked about the New Yorker. He said, what if, a lot. I bet he gets so much ass, he's ugly, I'd probably fuck him. <laughs> when I first moved to New York because I am unique, I worked at a trend restaurant off Bedford Ave with a girl who wore a tail and a really handsome French manager who laughed when I said I was an actor and told me he could be in a movie before me because he was handsome. I said, you're probably right, and I went into the walk-in freezer for a squat and cry. At my thinnest, I went to a club, LOL, and woke up in a stranger's bed, and when I turned around, he took the condom off, and I made him give me $60 for plan B, and he called me a bitch. It's not that bad, I don't know anyone who doesn't have a story. Last night, I did lunges in the bathroom at the movie theater. <laughs> because during the movie, I felt fat, and I felt my fat sitting on my fat. And how did my back get fat? I, part, I thought that part was safe. Now I am a circle, leaving a movie I paid to see to go to the bathroom to do a few lunges so I can eat a sandwich after the movie. I don't like it either. I don't like wasting time. I don't want to know anyone who knows how to surf. There is nothing relaxing about the beach. The only thing I've ever done in a bikini is sob. <laughs> XOXO. Um, Thank you. So our next author that we have reading is, I'm very excited for because she is one of those people who inspires us to do what we do. And I found out about her um, because when I decided I was gonna move to New York, back around the beginning of the year, um, I was in a long distance relationship with Zach and he decided to have her Cynthia send us or send me uh, her two zines which are for sale in the back uh, Secret Bully 1 and 2 and uh, we had an inside joke about sending each other small bright wonderful 
good things called seashells. And so he had her address it to Angelica Seashell Blevins, and she drew a little, you drew me this index card with a little seashell on it, said, thank you. <laughs> um, I loved it, I still have it. I use it as a bookmark all the time. And so it was wonderful to get the zine. I just reread Secret Bully number one in preparation for this to refamiliarize myself. And it's wonderful to get the zine that is basically a breakup letter with a city that you're still in love with. As she was moving away from New York, and I'm moving to New York, reading this letter that is all about what a wonderful, essentially, like lover I'm about to meet up with of a city. Um, so rereading it now that I've lived here for a few months, it felt like I was reading something completely different. Now I actually know what the city feels like. Now I know what some of these streets are. I know the difference in the water, uh, the ocean here versus LA. And all the words were so much heavier and more important and rang so much truer to my heart now. So I cannot believe that she's here tonight. Everybody, please put your hands together for Cynthia Schammer. Wow. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really honored to be here. This is, I didn't really know what to expect, and this is so cool. Um, cool. Uh, I'm going to read a piece that isn't finished yet, um, so... Good luck. It's called uh, Elements of the In-Between. Two years ago, I spent some time watching Long Island Medium. For those of you have, who haven't been blessed by the voice of Teresa Caputo, she's a sassy, bleached out, tangerine-skinned Long Island mom who can apparently talk to the dead, struggling to record her sessions on cassette tape and take down notes with her two-inch acrylics. Think Jersey Shore all grown up meets poltergeist. Despite having a strong disbelief in her ability and no resemblance whatsoever to my own deceased Long Island mother, I still cried during each episode. Her voice, in all of its New York glory, was like a prayer to these people. Like the time she walked into Ferrara Bakery in Little Italy and said, there's a crap load of spirit in here. <laughs> <laughs> you can see that on YouTube, it's great. Um, these people were searching for something they never thought they could access until they could. They needed a little more a small message of hope born from closure. During one episode in particular, I got so worked up that when my cat jumped on top of the television and stared at me, something he's never done, I couldn't help but look him in his big orange face and ask, uh, mom, is that you? It was this absurd moment, and isn't that just life, when I saw my mother reincarnated in my overweight orange tabby, compelled by Teresa Caputo, that I knew I needed a question answered. Now, of course, there is some skepticism behind going to see a medium. If this person Googled me, literally some of the first things that would show up would be about my mom, because apparently I've accidentally and therapeutically made a life out of writing about grief. But I'm also a pretty spiritual person, especially when I'm alone in my room and there are like 15 lit candles and I'm chanting some weird inspirational shit I just improved at the moon and the tarot cards are freaking me out and I'm just writhing on the carpet. <laughs> But in all seriousness, there have been some real solid moments where I felt the energy of the dead. And that's what I truly believe in, energy. Like Carl Sagan said in Cosmos, we are made of star stuff. Our atoms were forged from the bellies of dead ancient stars, which gave way to the elements of the periodic table. Our atoms are recycled when we are no longer of this earth, incorporated into new molecules and combined with others. What I'm trying to say is, find me in a cloud, in a rainstorm, in the, ex in the exhale of a cat when I'm gone. This is at the base of my believing, when I unravel at my need to communicate with the energy of the dead while not believing in heaven or hell. It's what I needed when I went to see a spirit guide intuitive who channeled me to my mother one dust dusty sky day in Portland. I had been referred to this particular intuitive by multiple friends, telling me how truly life-changing she was. Her work is based on energy, healing, and spiritual wisdom. This July, with a flight out to Portland for work, I made an appointment. The intuitive and I talked, but we talked briefly. I only gave information I thought was pertinent, like what life was like for me emotionally before and after my mother died, but I never gave specifics. She laid me down on a massage table and felt my pulse, felt my gut, 
put crystals on the shrieking parts of my body and told me things I already knew. You want to have babies. You have issues moving forward with the things you want in life. You feel stuck. You don't drink enough water. She told me I would not speak with my guide. I would listen, and I would get to ask one question at the end. Close your eyes, she said, her voice like melted wax. I'm going to open the channel. My love, this is how it all began. My love, the name my mother called me from birth through our last exchanged words. All it took were those first, three wor those first two words to have me crying through closed eyes to know that my mother was truly there, to access the energy, the motion, the elements of the in-between. She talked about my unrelenting sadness, my writing, my doubts, and my father. She talked about my love, my future, our history. She talked about things no one else could talk about but us. And those specifics are all secrets I will keep. They had me crying for days straight in both fear and belief. But the question I asked, in only five words, that every child has burning in their gut is what matters, because in the end, it didn't really matter at all. It's a question that maybe defines your whole life, a question that allows your parents to pass judgment on all that you've done and all that you will do. I asked, are you proud of me? Because on my worst days of depression and grief, I feel as though I've let her down, even though she was my biggest cheerleader. And her answer was the least moving part of the whole experience, because I'd later find out that I knew the answer all along. The next morning, I climbed a mountain where the ferns turned into cedar trees and the cedar trees turned into peaks of wildflowers. There were times I wanted to give up because everything felt too formidable, too overwhelming, too beyond, but I didn't give up. At the top of the mountain, sweating and in pain, I saw a sea that was 90 miles away and I wept into what felt like the ending of one life and the beginning of another. I had felt her and then I had lost her again and it felt almost as shattering as the first time. But I knew that within this experience was something much greater. And without even thinking, I asked myself the same question I asked my mother the morning before and breathed my own answer out into the Oregon air. I am so proud of you, I said. And in that moment, I was. I had made it through the entire year I watched her die and the last 10 years without her. And after all of that, I still created the life for myself that I've always wanted. This was the first time I ever truly admitted to myself what a fucking champion I am. And here I was on the top of a literal mountain. Now a side note, yes, this mountain metaphor is such an obvious and cliche metaphor, and you may hate it because to be honest, I really do. But unless you've spoken with your dead mother and then immediately climbed a mountain, then you do not get an opinion right now. <laughs> So what are we looking for when we go looking for the dead? For me, it was an answer, a suture, an impossible occupancy of the void. I came out on the other side realizing the closure I needed was with myself. Spirit gives us what we need, not what we want, says Teresa Caputo. <laughs> and fuck her for being so right. <laughs> because sometimes to find solace, all it takes is a belief in something, which can be as simple as a candle flickering in a rested blue-black room, as gigantic as resurrecting the voice of the dead, or as difficult as actually believing in yourself. It's this, it's this magic that keeps us going, that gives us hope, that helps us find the answers we need. Thank you. Give it up for Cynthia Schammer! Woo! That was amazing. Um, we have one more author who's going to read tonight. Uh, she's almost here. And I just want to first thank you all for coming tonight. This has been so fun and so cool. And uh, Angelica, who's hosting with me, is the artist who draws everything for our posters and all our show promotion, the zine cover. The main thing I'm going to say right now is that we have a zine we've made with all the authors here tonight and other authors who we know and are working around uh, the town, if you will. And it's so cool. I saw it for the first time tonight, and I, I had full body chills. And uh, that's cool. But uh, the whole point of New American Comedy is that uh, it's inclusive, it's accepting, hate-free. We want everyone to be a part of it. And so uh, for every zine we make, we send out a call to anyone who wants to be involved. Whatever kind of work you do, we want you to submit. We want you to be a part of it. We want you to come to our shows. We want you to be a part of the shows. And we're doing uh, a show Monday, as I said earlier at Elvis Guest House, just a short walk away, which is a really cool bar, and it's going to be so fun, and we have a lot of 
insane, amazing comics. We have uh, Marsha Belsky, who does this whole blog called Headless Women of Hollywood, where she highlights the fact that every movie poster is a woman's ass and a man's face, and that should be illegal because I'm a human being with a head and a brain, and, and et cetera, et cetera. And uh, a lot of other really great people. It's going to be... I used to be a SAT tutor, and I would, when someone got a problem right, I'd be like, and they're like, what are you doing? And I was like, this is not the job for me. Um, <clears throat> if you can't tell by my energy, I am waiting on the next reader. And I know you're like, more, more of her, more of her. Um, so I will go ahead and, uh, okay, fine. <laughs> I'll read more poems. Uh, they do pour out of me. I don't have, a, have an MFA. I don't. Um, but what if we're all in a grad school? called life. <laughs> Can I get a standing O? I'd love that tonight. Nope, I've been told no by one of my um, co-workers. <laughs> Imagine having a co-worker. Okay. <laughs> I live in a garbage can. That sounded kind of good. <laughs> my thing is that I actually have a good voice and I like to sing it and people say like, well, you actually have a good voice. I'm like, I know. <laughs> It's hard to, when you have so many talents, it is hard to sort of find a career that uses them all. <laughs> Unless you're hot, and then you can do whatever the fuck you want. <laughs> Conventionally hot. Um, someone from the audience just texted me. I'm going to read some poetry. <laughs> <laughs> this is called, stop it. <laughs> this is called, poem I wrote. Ding dong. That's, as you heard my catchphrase. This is called poem I wrote after my dad texted me that I was gross for not shaving my armpits. I am not famous. One time I had dinner with Ethan Hawke's mom. She made the meal family style when she dunked her fork into my chicken tikka masala. I'm not famous. She is a friend of a friend of a friend's parents. They are lawyers. I told my dad I wanted to be a doctor, but it turns out I wanted to be an actor on Grey's Anatomy. I don't want to be an actor on Grey's Anatomy anymore, but I would make out with you in a supply closet if you asked me to. One time, my ex-boyfriend, Ben, broke up with me. When we got back together, we made out next to a fountain, and he said, you've gotten better at that. And I said, at kissing, question mark? And he said, yeah. And I laughed and felt very bad. <laughs> Bodies are hard and mine is soft and often in the way. You can tell me you like it a million times. Some days I will believe you and some days I will not. I think the worst thing is when you think someone's your friend and then they tell you they love jogging. <laughs> I played basketball in high school. One time I scored a basket for the wrong team and part of me was so embarrassed. And part of me was like, LOL, is it cute to be ditzy? I wonder if Andrew is in the bleachers. <laughs> Andrew is a boy I had a crush on for six or so years. One time I asked him to the dance and he said, I don't know. <laughs> and we ended up going together. I guess he did not get a better offer. He is fat now and has a car. <laughs> Sometimes when I feel extra in love, I tell my boyfriend I am a little bug and he knows what I mean. People hate people who are in love, and I won't succumb to that hatred. <laughs> Should I go? <laughs> Is Jacqueline here? <laughs> cool, cool, cool. Um, sicky, sicky. I'm going to read one more, and then we'll just maybe call it. But she was here, you know. And I, th I think she's really wonderful, so thank you. Uh, this is called Poem I Wrote Before Taking a Shit. We're going down. Um, I'm so uncool, it is exhausting. I'm always drunk and yelling my secrets and pulling my pants up. I'm a very loud sandwich in a very quiet cafe where everyone else is writing definitely good plays. Bob said I was good at lots of things and maybe playwriting was just not one of those things. He was right and I was 18. 
I'm fuckable. I go to therapy and Cynthia tells me I'm attractive. <laughs> Anyone can fuck, it doesn't change a thing. You say it is okay to be anxious. You say love is like a long worm. I think I have a yeast infection. This is called poem I wrote after taking a shit. There was the before and now there's the after and that's sort of, art is a journey. And here I am, the center of Hollywood. <laughs> Taking it all in. Okay. Hello, it's me from before. I'm sitting across from you eating my sandwich like an Oreo to pass the time. Can you believe today I just did not go to work and no one has called? I do not think I will go again. <laughs> there is a lot to do in East Williamsburg. I still don't know quite how to be. I would like to go to some events. I want to ask everyone on the street how they spend their days. I want to fuck that fat dude who is rude to me so hard. I always thought he looked like he should smell bad, but he just did not. I want to lick him dry. Beef jerky is gross, and it is a gross food to like. Can that be my thing? <laughs> At my New Year's Eve party, we talked about this girl named Barbara. I'm like, imagine being 20 and being named Barbara. It's like, sorry, bitch. <laughs> I just got a text saying <laughs> Jacqueline's coming up but the elevator is stuck. <laughs> oh my God. And that's life. And I don't have you guys ever seen an action movie? <laughs> cool. Um, so that's sort of what tonight is like. Uh, I don't know if that makes any sense. Sort of the vibe. Um, okay. <laughs> Tonight is about LOL. There she is, my queen. <laughs> What's up? Let me let me help. No. Switch it on. I don't I don't Ooh. Women always Ooh. think women need help. Oh. <laughs> uh, I'll just give our ending spiel right now. Yes. Uh, of course, thank you all for coming. Thank you so much. This is such like a do-it-yourself thing. You know, you hear that phrase so uh, fucking often, but God damn it, we really are. We're staying up all night not getting paid just because we love this genuinely. We're so happy to be here. This room gives me chills for yeah. like personal reasons. It's like so I good. love yeah, books. Give it up for the Strand. This uh, is so uh, amazing that they're having us here. We, we cannot believe that they let us they let us even be here. It makes us feel, feel very validated. Very cool. Um, but so, of course, uh, we've talked about having a lot of events. You can see everything online at newamericancomedy.com. We have an amazing website that's constantly changing because it's all, like, literally being hand-coded from the ground up by Zach Mandeville, oh, yeah. who is not only writing about AI, but possibly becoming one himself as he learns how to properly live on the internet. Um, but so it's got all of our everything, all of our everything up there. We have archives of past shows. We have tons of videos from all of our past shows. We have recorded some pretty funny people, if I do say so And myself. lots of sicky, sicky art from Angelica. She's... Aww. So on Insta <laughs> at my milkweed. <laughs> so we do have zines in the back. Um, like we said, we're very excited that we got to get together a collection of amazing artists to contribute to our first and now second zine. Um, they are available online as well if you just don't feel like buying one today, but they're here, so you know. Um, we also have posters from previous events. If some of you have been at previous events and be like, oh, that poster is so sick, I want to get one. Well, we, we have them today. We actually have them for you. <laughs> We do. I we know. do. I'm going to get all of them. Oh, yeah. I think also the highlight is that if you don't have cash, you can pay with Oh, art. yeah. Like we said, Zach Mandeville is an actual product of the internet. We don't have to take your physical money. We can take your bitcoins. <laughs> um, your point zero 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 one bitcoin to pay for a $2 What is a bitcoin? I think it's like $150 now is one bitcoin. Does anybody know? Can you believe the LA no, stuff? Literally no one knows. <laughs> I am the expert of the internet. <laughs> the LA <laughs> stuff. <laughs> Someone shoot this. It is my pilot. Oh, oh my there God. she is. Oh. Okay, I am. Um, Bye. Now, yeah, now that you know about the zines in the back, et cetera, et cetera, I'm so excited to introduce our next reader. Um, I'm a huge fan girl, big time. Um, 
She is such a funny stand-up, so good, and also wrote an amazing book called How to Weep in Public, and it's so funny. I just think she's the best. Uh, I'm so glad she's on the show. Please give it up for Jacqueline Novak! I was literally trapped. <laughs> okay, it's like so rude, like, I don't know, nothing worse than like, where is the performer? You know what I mean? Like the next person is like so like disrespectful, like deeply. But I was like physically tied up <laughs> um, <laughs> by like the mechanics like of the building. You know what I mean? And like, and like it was a series of, you know, like, <sighs> like uh, everyone like wa wanting to help, but no one believing. You, you know what I mean? Like, you know, when people think you're not operating, like, you know, like you didn't push the button or, or, or like it will take you there even though it doesn't light. And it's like, like, no, but I did that. Like I've literally done every iteration of like the journey on the elevator. And like, and then it, it was just like, it was bad down there, guys. <laughs> it was really bad down there. I mean, they were, they were very nice. I just need to like assure you <laughs> that this is not like how I operate. I mean, yes, I shouldn't have left in the first place. That was risky. But it was like a good 30 minutes ago just to like smoke a quick cig. You know what I mean? It's like is part of the literary tradition. <laughs> um, like so I felt, oh, anyway. Just still pr processing that myself. Uh, Rich, really nice man I spent some time with works here. And he was like, funny, because he was asking me about what event I was doing, and I'm like, well, I'm probably not doing it now, because it's like, <laughs> happened, and, and like, uh, you know, we talked about things, and it was interesting, it was interesting, because it kind of reminds me of this time I went like rock climbing <laughs> in high school, and I was like afraid, and the like counselor guy, I mean like, he, whatever, like, you know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> the guy playing that role in that situation he was like very into like having casual chats while you were doing like the most terrifying part that you'd never done. You know, that was like his way. Like people always have these ideas. <laughs> like, you know, like I'm going to ask you about like your favorite song and it's going to like distract you or whatever and it's an, into relaxing and it's like, you know what I mean? Anyway, but he was great and he, you know. <laughs> All right, so I really do want you to purchase my book. <laughs> um, I know that's the same old tune, you know, authors are always singing. You know what I mean? Oh, purchase, buy two. I mean, it's not a new story. Um, but, but there you are, you know what I mean? <laughs> so many things about it. It's, I really didn't want to open this thing after it was finished. You know what I mean? Revisit the scene of the crime. Um, it was a, so it's very painful for me to to read words that are committed, you know? But one must, one must. It's just the price of doing business. The cost of doing business. <laughs> so this is my um, depression memoir humor book. <laughs> I wrote into a little bio that it was a humor, humor nonfiction or something, or, or no, I wrote humor memoir, like two nouns. <laughs> Uh, purpose, you know, on purpose, like, I thought a dash would be crass, but I still wanted that sentiment, and then, like, someone corrected it, in the person I sent it to, and changed it to humorous memoir, which I found, like, deeply embarrassing, do you know what I mean? <laughs> like, because it's sort of like, is it? I don't know, like, the second, <laughs> second, <laughs> the second the adjective is, like, being applied, it's like saying, like, a fantastic, it's like saying, a magical and real piece of fiction or something you're like uh, and it was like magical realism <laughs> <laughs> all right so here we are um so i'm going to read so this book is um i'll just read something and we'll see what happens um so this is your first therapist Convince her that she fi fixed you at the end of every session, then go home for more suffering. Um, all right, so 
it was high school, it was in high school that I saw my first therapist. Not quite the experience I've been looking for, I've been hoping for and looking forward to. She was nice, but seemed to think I was blowing things out of proportion. She felt that way, I realize now, because I never spoke to her in the stark language of depression. I wasn't someone who came in, slumped in the chair, and mumbled about wanting to die. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I, was, I was too caught up in the cloak of my self-help language. She wasn't going to analyze me. I was going to beat her to the punch. It was a pattern I would repeat with therapists for many years. The absolute worst therapeutic experience I ever had came when I decided to try a new technique, hypnotherapy. When I met this new therapist, we'll call him Cliff, I suspected I was in trouble just by the look of him. Cliff didn't look like a therapist. His body hadn't withered away. <laughs> He didn't seem to be living a life of the mind. <laughs> Not that he was particularly healthy or fit. He just looked regular. He had a slight paunch tucked into a casual Friday kind of cowboy pants and shirt ensemble. But I tried to keep an open mind. I started to tell Cliff about my history of depression. But before I knew it, he was interrupting me. Hold up a minute, he said. People have a tendency to come into therapy and want to tell their story. <laughs> Oh no, I was going to have to prove my depression to a guy who probably once self-diagnosed depression, but realized he had merely forgotten to eat breakfast, and then decided everyone else who claimed to be depressed was like him being a bit dramatic. He went on to suggest that people have narratives about themselves that they repeat over and over again, in effect solidifying them and turning them into self-fulfilling prophecies. Ugh. This was such old news to me. <laughs> he hadn't even been listening. I could tell because I'd very deliberately just stuck to the facts for this very reason, so as to carefully avoid running a negative script. And then all of a sudden, he clapped his hands together and said, bam. Now, why did I do that? <laughs> I smiled politely to surprise me and jolt me out of an old script, but he wasn't listening and instead started to explain, I did it to surprise you and jolt you out of your old script. <laughs> Good God, man. I realized right away I was dealing with a Tony Robbins fan, and as I spent a lot of words earlier in the book, I am a big Tony Robbins fan, so that's important. <laughs> I tried to jump in and explain to him in the most delicate way possible that I wasn't some idiot in a bad mood who was simply ignorant of the many mood-shifting strategies presented in the personal development section. I was trying to clue him in that his two-bit Tony act wasn't going to work for me, but the dude could not take a hint. I even dropped a reference to Tony's work <laughs> to subtly alert him that if he passed off Tony's ideas as his own, I'd know. He then got very excited that I'd heard of his king. <laughs> Look, he said, I've done the personal power weekends, I've walked on the coals, and I've met Sage. Tony often has workshop participants walk across hot coals to prove to them that they can do anything, and Tony's wife is named Sage. <laughs> I tried to shift the conversation back to my crippling depression, but again he interrupted me. What happens, he said, when a bike's chain isn't greased? Look, Cliff, I don't fucking know. <laughs> It slips off the gear, it jams, it cracks. The fact is, I know what you're getting at, but I don't have the knowledge of bicycles to answer within your impotent metaphor. <laughs> I was completely un unimpressed by everything he said and knew exactly what he was trying to do at every moment, and yet he insisted on interpreting the expression on my face as one of a closed-off woman shocked by his unorthodox methods. <laughs> We finally got around to the hypnotherapy. He explained it to me slowly and idiotically, like I was some bonneted Puritan afraid the therapy was actually devil worship. He said, I'm not going to wave a clock in front of your face and make you cluck like a chicken, <laughs> and you'll be in full control the whole time. He said it was as if women regularly lost control around them, uh, of themselves around him. Ew, Cliff. It was just like the time a young suitor warned me of his seductive ability of saying, Women have compared me to some pretty terrible but effective people in history. <laughs> so you're referring to Hitler, <laughs> I replied. And the guy looked impressed that I knew who he was referring to. And the 
creepiness with the therapist only got worse. He told me to lie back on the couch and relax, so I did. But I felt weird lying there while he was staring at, while he sat there staring at me. I didn't want to self-consciously cover my breasts with my hands, so I left my arms at my side. But then suddenly it felt like my boobs were resting on top of my body like two squat Cinderella pumpkins on a table. How can I get out of here as soon as possible, I thought. I decided to just grin and bear it. The hypnotherapy exercise was over soon enough since it, basically, it was basically some deep breathing. I'd force a breath, and he'd say things like, that a girl. <laughs> After it was over, I made up some bullshit he wanted to hear. He nodded and grinned maniacally. I went home and reenacted this entire shtick to my parents over dinner. I feel bad shitting on Cliff, and I'm sure he was helpful to some people, but I felt like I was watching a new Cutco knife salesman pitch me the knives. A salesman who didn't know that I was the president of Cutco. <laughs> Years later, I ran into Cliff at the same therapy center, and he noted how radiant I looked. <laughs> the moral of my story is that as you enter this new wide world of therapy, remember that just because wisdom comes on the back of fools and little children doesn't mean you have to sit at the feet of every idiot you come across. Okay, you may want to shell out a few sessions with a fool or two, if only because afterward it will give you a brief but well-earned sense of superiority while you head home as depressed as when you arrived. I've had some therapists who weren't as bad as Cliff, but instead of trying to challenge me, they'd be over, overly charmed by my depressive wit. I get it. There can be something romantic, poetic about depression, especially if the depressed person has a way with words. <laughs> but really, this doesn't do either of you any good. If you want to make sure your doctor treats your depression as pathology of the brain and not as the artistic creation of a young poet wrestling with the angels <laughs> over life's mysteries, then you need to make sure you're not charming him too much. <sighs> Let me just see how I can close. Because <laughs> there's still a page and a half. <laughs> um, whenever I found a therapist too delighted by me, I knew I had to get out. They were incapable of seeing past my charms and notions. I was like, Woody Allen in there? <laughs> they couldn't have bathed in more aesthetically pleasing angst if they'd spent a night at the opera. I could see it when I looked up. They'd crack a smile and shift in their chair like a favorite TV show had just come on. <sighs> With one extremely expensive therapist, I attempted to drop the act and be as utterly boring as the depression was, flatly mumbling in response to questions about how I felt, things like, I don't know, I just... She seemed appreciative of how much I was suffering, but she had trouble staying awake for it. Sometimes she'd start to nod off in her chair. I'd pretend not to notice, glance out the window, and cough to wake her up. If you want to use your energy performing your mood, do it for other people in the waiting room. Those are the people to wear a beret for. When you leave, when you enter, leave your shades on and pass time reading letters to a young poet. When you head out, adjust those shades and visibly steal yourself. Pause before opening the door to the hallway and head out into the waiting room like a reluctant gladiator who has accepted his fate. Like a ro bravely steps into the arena. You, you get the sentence. <laughs> Set a pick between the next client and the door to the office and maintain the block for as, for as long as it takes to get through the first few lines of Richard III. Now is the winter of my discontent. Thank you. <laughs> Give it up for Jacqueline Novak! Woo! And for her patience in the elevator incident. That sounds, that's, you know, <laughs> life happened. Uh, I have that on a t-shirt. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, we're so glad you're here. Again, the merch table we is love you. you can buy Jacqueline's book. You can buy the zine and posters and all that. And uh, Zach Mano right back there can handle all of your money in any form. Literally. Awesome. Thanks for coming. And we have a show Monday at Elvis Guest. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.